thank you all for being here with us in the becoming more culturally inclusive uh, training. I will pass to Mario Venta, which will serve as our interpreter for today. So Mario, thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Mario. So for those of you who have not uh, yet done so, if you would like to have this interpreted into Spanish, uh, look at the globe in the bottom right and go ahead and click on that and, in, and grab the Spanish. Otherwise, um, the rest of us will be presenting in English and you'll have the option for interpretation. Welcome, everyone. Um, we are going to record this meeting and Erica, I'll ask you to go ahead and record. Also, while we are doing that, if you wouldn't mind, please drop your name and organization in the chat so we have a sense of who's here and welcome. We're so excited to see such great participation today. So welcome to Becoming More Culturally Inclusive. This is brought to you by the Build Trust, Build Health Group as part of Live Well Greenville and the Hispanic Alliance. We are so grateful to have you here today and just a little bit about the Build Trust, Build Health Collaborative. Greenville County's Build Trust, Build Health, Formatar La Confianza, Formatar La Salud project is working to understand the root causes that are driving higher obesity rates among Hispanic youth and to develop community action plans that help to mitigate health, health disparities and disrupt key systems that are contributing to these conditions. To explore these questions, Greenville County partners, which include Livewell Greenville, the Hispanic Alliance, Furman University, Clemson University, Bon Secours St. Francis, PASOS, Prisma Health, uh, SCDHEC, Unity Health on Main, and Clemson SNAP-Ed, join the Build Health Challenge, a national funding collaborative working to address the important health disparities in communities across the US. Build Health Build Trust investigators conducted community focus groups and interviews with local stakeholders living in and serving the White Horse Road corridor to gain deeper understanding of the factors that affect the health of our families. The Build Health partners used this community input along with group model building strategies to map the local systems that are in play. Key insights that emerged during this process inform the Build Health Community Action Plan, which focuses on building trust within communities uh, with the services, service organizations that are providing healthcare and social services, et cetera, to improve access to and use of community resources, and Build Health, which is increasing access to healthy eating and active living resources for families living in and along the White Horse Road corridor. Again, we will be recording this training in the hopes that people who access it in the future will have it available for training purposes. With that, I wanna turn it over to Sabrina Smith and the rest of the team to lead us through this webinar today and welcome once again. Hello everyone. Um, Erica, if you don't mind going to slide five, today's objectives. Um, so today's objectives are to define cultural awareness and sensitivity, discuss how to integrate culturally inclusive practices at our workplace, and learn strategies to build culturally inclusive work environments. We will have time for question and answers during, during both of our presentations today. Um, so please, if you do have a question, just add it in the chat and we'll make sure to address it at those times. Sabrina, we've been asked to just take a, a little bit longer pauses for translation. Sorry, Mario. Thank you for that reminder, Sally. All right. So let's get started with a little energizer question. I am uh, currently reading the book, The Art of Gathering by Priya Parker. And in the first chapter, actually in the first line, first paragraph of this book, it asks, why do we gather? And I thought this was a great question for us all to answer today. 
So in the chat, please add in, why do you think we gather? Why do we gather at work or in our personal lives? Just put your answer in the chat. To share information, social connection, yes. Support each other. We gather to go further. Fellowship, these are great. To learn, to meet new people. Yes, keep adding those answers in the chat. These are great guys. Um, in the book, it states, we gather to solve problems we can't solve on our own. We gather to make decisions. We gather to honor and acknowledge. We gather to build our neighborhoods and communities. And we gather to welcome. And today I think that is why we are gathering to learn how we as individuals and organizations can create more welcoming environments that are inclusive for all. So on slide seven, so why does Greenville need culturally inclusive practices? So Greenville boasts rich culture and diversity. Organizations must address the diverse needs of our population in a manner that represents cultural traditions, raises the engagement of all community members and builds future citizens prepared to positively participate in our society. The time has come for our community to boldly engage in transforming policies and practices in order to improve opportunities and access for all. Um, so if you will advance the slide, Erica. And the sources today um, are listed on these slides. The data that we are representing here is listed in the lower left-hand corner. But our demographic picture shows the diversity found within our county. So white, black, Hispanic, Asian, American Indian, and so many more. Today, we will focus on our state's fastest growing population, the Hispanic population. You can see here that Greenville is approaching the national percentage for Hispanic representation. So Greenville is at 11% where the US is at 18.7%. Um, Greenville actually is, um, has a higher representation than the state across the state, which is at 6.9. So another question for everyone is, do you think your organization's employee diversity match our Hispanic demographic at 11%? Yes or no? Go ahead and put those answers in the chat. So I'm seeing a lot of no's. So there's probably a mismatch, right? And that's, that's normal. So on the next slide, this next slide illustrates citizenship status. So although over half of the South Carolina Hispanic population age 25 and older identify as US citizens, approximately 46% do not. So number one, we are aware that our organizations don't match our demographics. So that's something that we now know and can adjust for. And then also we know that almost half of South Carolina does not, does not um, identify as a US 
citizen. So therefore it is evident that we as community-based organizations must fully embrace culturally inclusive practices to ensure the success of our community. So I also have the pleasure, if you go to the next slide, Erica, of introducing the person that you actually came here to listen to, not me, um, Mr. Cornell Wright, who our team has gotten to know over the past few months through the Build Trust Build Health Project. Mr. Wright serves as the Executive Director of the Department of Health and Human Services, which is like our DHEC here in South Carolina, um, at the Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities. He is a subject matter expert around the areas of health, equity, and disparities, minority health, and community engagement. Wright, an active member in the health community, serves various groups, organizations, and boards, including the Patient-Centered Outcome Research Institute, where he serves on the Clinical Effectiveness and Decision Science Advisory Panel, and the Southeastern Health Equity Council as part of the National Partnership for Action to End Health Disparities, serving as a co-chair to the Social Determinants of Health Committee. He has received awards and recognition for his contributions to health from the National Institutes of Health, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, North Carolina Central University, and the National Minority Quality Forum. I want you to please help me welcome Mr. Cornell Wright by waving hello. If you can, I'm not sure if everybody, if we can see everyone's faces, but we know you're there waving. So Mr. Cornell Wright, take it away. Thank you for having me so much. Um, it's always an honor and pleasure to um, be connected on so many different levels with so many different people. And I appreciate the, um, everyone that's behind the scenes and front of the scenes doing this work. I'll try to make sure I don't talk too fast you know, in this more northern part of the Carolinas. We may talk faster than some people. But I know we have interpreter services, so I, I will slow it down than my normal pace of talking. Uh, and that's not a slight to anyone. My mother um, was born in South Carolina. And so South Carolina has a special place of. Um, reverence for me. Uh, she was born in a small little place called Latta, South Carolina. And um, for those that, that know South Carolina know that, that it's a little blip on the map near, near Dillon. And um, we used to love coming down and following the signs to see Pedro and make it to south of the border and make that our rest stop and see family. So it's always a pleasure. When um, I was being introduced, there was mention of the Southeastern Health Equity um, Council, and it said I was a co-chair. And none of that is wrong. That is very correct. But I do want to acknowledge um, my my other co-chair in that work um, was Brenda Hughes, who actually works at DHEC here in South Carolina. And so um, she is an amazing person, amazing partner, and. Um, we still keep in touch and she's just so amazing. Oh, actually I can share my own uh, screen if y'all let me. I don't have to be burdened with, uh, with the, the task of following me as I talk. Do I have permission to share? Yes. Okay. And we are seeing your screen. It's not my screen. That's Erica's screen. Oh, I'm sorry. Here. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
Okay, so I won't be before you too long, um, which I know is probably something you hear a lot in the South and people don't mean it, but I do mean it. But I do want to provide a little bit of context to what we're talking about today. And um, by no means is this a, uh, a one and done conversation. This is something that will start the conversation um, as we jump into broader, older um, conversations as we do this work. And Barty kind of been introduced um, as being a part of the North Carolina Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities um, out of the Department of Health and Services in North Carolina and have worked with um, so many people that are on the call to help bring this day forward. I also want to celebrate and acknowledge our Secretary for Health and Human Services, Mr. Cody Kinsley. I also want to acknowledge our other leadership in equity space here in North Carolina, our Chief, Chief Health Equity Officer, Victor Armstrong, and our Assistant Secretary for Equity and Inclusion, Angela Bryant. And so um, as we get into this conversation, Please, if you have questions, comments, or ideas, or need clarity, um, feel free to put some put those things in the chat. Um, and hopefully, by the time we get to the Q and A, we'll have some, some time to provide clarity or answers to what's ahead. So, um, I wanted to get into some key terms um, that that we'd probably be using a lot today, but also just the level set. So we think about cultural sensitivity and awareness. You know, this is you know, the knowledge, understanding, and acceptance of, um, of culture and cultures and, um, and the cultural identity. And what's that mean? You know, people are different. Um, we'll talk about more of that when we talk about diversity. But, not every culture is the same. There are some that are very similar and some are very different. And having a presence about us to understand um, why this is important um, is why we're here. And um, I, I give all the kudos in the world to those that help put this on so that we can have these conversations and, and fully get you know, past whatever barriers that have prevented us from having them in the past and we can move forward. I think bias is another um, thing we need to raise up. And um, when you think about bias, you know, this is a, a tendency or a trend or inclination, feeling or opinion um, that, you know, is usually connected to some type of frequency or unreasonable notion may exist within you or um, you know, more concretely we usually talk about explicit or implicit bias. Um, explicit is you know when people are fully aware and fully conscious of the bias that they have and it is um, something that is done usually intentionally whereas implicit bias may be done unintentionally and may not be aware of that bias. And we also see these type of connections when we think about microaggressions. When we think about microaggressions. Now, these are statements or actions or incidents um, that, that can occur that you know, may intentionally discriminate people or groups of people, um, especially if they're from marginalized communities and populations. And so, you know, some things that we say and don't even think about could be a microaggression. You know, asking, and I learned this a long time ago not to ask this, so don't think that I do. But asking uh, a woman if she's pregnant could be a microaggression. And asking um, people if they're going to have kids, uh, you know, that could be a microaggression. I don't really fully understand everything about that person or what they've been through or if they've been struggling in certain areas. And um, we may think it's normal conversation, but it also could be something that's triggering for people. So we have to be careful even on how we relate or think we're relating to people that 
people we know or people that we work with or even people in our community because we don't want to turn them off by um, presenting uh, microaggressions and um, really disconnecting from people that shouldn't be connected. A little bit about diversity. Um, and you know, this really talks about our differences and um, even in some cases how we are alike um, in, in a lot of cases. And we'll, we'll get more into understanding diversity as we go along, but I think diversity is a really important part of the conversation. As our um, health equity, with the opportunity and ability for everyone to have good health and have it sustained and maintained, as well as those unfair differences that permit that to happen, which we call the health inequities. And in a way, we measure it all um, by comparison and what we see in the outcomes. We call those the disparities, that measurable gap or distance that we see in the metrics that we compare. So if we're saying that um, African-Americans and American Indians um, die from complications to diabetes two and three times higher than that of whites, that difference that you see in the difference, that's, um, that's the disparity. And so you have to be really careful on some of these conversations as well, um, because a lot of times the way we say things can change the complexity of what actually happens. And so a lot of us have probably heard that we want to eliminate health disparities and it ended with a period. Well, if you just stop right there, you're not really getting to the whole issue or how we should be looking at that issue. Because if I told you right now, you know, Sabrina Smith and I could eliminate health disparities before we get on this call, you know, most of y'all would not believe us. Sabrina, uh, Sabrina, I wish you would shake your head and say yes, that you believe me, that we can do that. Yes, just so shaking our head yes. So I had a good team player with me now. Let me tell you how we would be able to do so, just using the language that, you know, we want to eliminate health disparities, period. We just talked about how that measurable gap of distance is what we talk about when we're looking at the outcomes of these disparities. So, um, Sabrina and I are going to eliminate health disparities before one o'clock. So what we're going to do, um, using the diabetes uh, example we gave earlier, is give everybody diabetes. And so if we give everybody sickness or illness or disease, there's no disparity to measure because everybody's sick. So understanding that language is so important shows us that if we just say we want to eliminate health disparities, period, doesn't really get to where we want to get to. But it could do more harm than good if we make it. The language is so important. And we'll talk a little bit more about how language is important. So no, Sabrina and I are not trying to give everybody diabetes, but we do want us to think about how important what we say uh, has to mirror what we do in our actions. And so, um, when we think about those factors that can greatly influence the way we live, work, play, worship, and engage with one another, we call those the drivers and determinants of health. And um, that's an important piece of the conversation. So I know there's plenty of definitions and terms that we can go through, and we won't go through all of them, but I do want to raise up how important it has been, especially in the public health space, to um, have health in all policies. But now we're starting to see that we need a lens of fairness. Um, and having health equity in our policies is very important uh, to promote that lens of fairness. And we'll even go even deeper in that in a moment. I also want to define for you something that we've been, a term we've been using greatly here in North Carolina is historically marginalized populations. And this is really based on how people identify and how they are identified. And so it's not just ba based on race and ethnicity. Very important though, to understand that race and ethnicity are two important factors in what we measure. But also, you know, where do people live? Like if they're in a rural area versus an urban area, um, you know, uh, are you part of a, a certain community, whether it be disabled community, LGBT plus communities, um, whether if you're homeless or a veteran, or um, if you're in a um, you know a migrant family or community, 
or immigrant community, like what does that mean in terms of historically marginalized populations? It really means these individuals or groups that have not always been a part of the conversation uh, to be successful in getting resources, having good and sustained health, or getting opportunities to, to live better lives. And so we call these uh, HMPs uh, for short. We've created a whole uh, work group around connecting uh, the dots to um, have better equitable outcomes. And, um, and a lot of this work started at the beginning of COVID so about two years ago, where we are now. And it's been important to sustain that work to make sure that the uh, very principles that we want to see lived out in our work and our policies are actually put to the um, pushed over to the side like, like they have historically been. And so this is important as we raise it. Back to the conversation about language. Right, so wait, excuse me for interrupting. Can you take just a breath to let Mario catch up? <laughs> I knew I'd talk too fast. <laughs> You're actually not talking too fast. It's a lot of content. It is. <laughs> Let me go back. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty of like, you treat it like a conversation. <laughs> Let me know when you're ready. Also, Mr. Wright, if you can speak up just a little bit, um, I think your audio is going in and out slightly. So you're saying you don't like my very white voice? Time and place. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Is that better? Okay, we can continue. Thank you. So is he reading everything on the slides? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, that's gonna be adjusted. Okay, thanks. He doesn't have to read everything on the slides. I'll, I'll talk over it. If he's translating for me, that'd be better um, for now. And then um, I don't think I've ever had these slides translated, but I will try. I'm not, so sure how long that would take on my end. But the conversation about language being was so important, as you can see from that interaction itself, is to make sure that when we talk about equality and equity, we know that they're two different things. And um, you know, we we jump into this space where we see that equality talks more about giving everybody the same thing regardless if you need it or not. Equity really speaks to meet, meeting people where they are based on need and demonstrated needs. Excuse me. In liberation, you'll see in this box where they've gotten rid of the fence and the enhancements. And then the people that are trying to watch the game can actually see it. But then we need to go to a next step, right? And that next step is inclusion, making sure that community members and stakeholders are part of the process um, and not just spectators, but actually really in the game to help improve their own health outcomes. Um, <clears throat> and then not just on a team where they, they don't get any playing time, but actually 
a vital part of the organization, a part of the process, a part of the community that's helping um, to do this work together. I threw in here a couple of uh, visuals that looks at this entire spectrum of inclusion, because I think it's important to have this and have it shared. Um, and, and so many times when we think about uh, this work, we, we tend to forget about people that we don't see in ourselves. And so um, when we think about disability communities, like are we always or most times um, considering them in our activities as a part of the process? Um, so one thing that we've done, uh, especially when we were doing a lot of work with COVID was to incorporate like a disabilities checklist um, that we worked with our disabilities team um, to make sure that when people were going to get tested or vaccinated, um, that the site was really um, conducive for people with disabilities or people from disability communities. And how inclusive is that work um, that we do together really a part of that process? And so in meetings that we have um, in, in, on the state level now, we also try to make sure that we include interpreters um, in, in different ways, but not even just language that we think about like Spanish translation, but also um, do we have captioning for our uh, deaf, our deafblind, our hard of hearing communities. And then um, in a lot of cases, looking at the communication um, element to make sure that it's got readability uh, in the, the way of people that have low vision or, or, or compromised vision uh, can, can hear uh, things in a way that is readable. Um, and that's important to know these things when we talk about like communication, equity, and language accessibility. And then when we look at this total spectrum, especially around uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, how does it also promote a sense of belonging? And how is that connected to everything that we do? So we know that we've got um, a need for diversity, we'll, and we'll jump into some of these terms a little bit more too, um, in equity and inclusion. But do people feel like they are a part of the process and belong as a part of all of this greater strategy? And I think that's what's important uh, to kind of unearth in our organizations and in our work with our communities, is to know that when we are really um, looking at this work, are we being good stewards of the work and, and ushering in this um, sense of belonging that people feel that if they're at the table, do they have a voice with that seat at the table? And is that voice with that seat valued? And so I love belonging way more than I've ever loved the word tolerance um, because it really speaks to the more equitable and inclusive nature, how we can be diverse and also accepting. So I wanted to just kind of talk about some common barriers that we need face. And I um, don't want to think too long, my time on those on this shirt. But um, some of the barriers that we do, we do see are cross-sectional, cross-community, um, and even internally to our organization. I won't go over all of these. I do want to um, bring forth a few that could be problematic for us. This issue of labeling. Um, sometimes we see community members um, or patients being called non-compliant or non-adherent or frequent flyers, meaning that they engage with health systems often. Um, and if we're not getting to root causes, then these um, problems will persist. So um, part of the issue may be that our health practitioners, our medical teams, our health professional teams may practice something called colorblind care, where they, they say they, they don't see color. And we may need you to see color. We need you to see that my experiences are different than yours. 
in that where I come from or what I experience um, is, is different than sometimes what other people experience. And there's not this one size fit all approach to caring for someone. Um, there may be similarities, but there definitely are differences and that we need to be treated with respect, dignity, and honor as, as we go forward. Some of the other barriers are based on like geographic location and what's accessible to you, um, including food access or the lack thereof, and then making sure that we're able to speak in plain language to make sure people understand what we're talking about. Um, lots of influences on uh, equity and how to get there. Um, and one important one is policy. And um, policy isn't just these national, state, or local laws or procedures or regulations. But it also can be stuff that you govern yourself by on an everyday basis, whether it be formally or informally. One of those things, and you know, blink twice really hard if you've ever heard of what happens in your house stays in your house. Um, this is a policy that has been harming many of our communities for years. Then also not understanding um, that when you go to a, a doctor or a medical team or an appointment and they ask you about your family health history, you either don't know it or don't realize that you know it. Um, case in point, we need sometimes to have a translator. Um, for even of us that speak English as a first language, we may talk differently or amongst our, our community members. And you may hear about grandma saying that she had the sugar. We're not talking about Big C Crystal, we're talking about she had diabetes. And if you don't know to make that correlation, you know, you may not write it down in, in your family health history. So we just have to make sure that our, our different worlds are, are combining and talking to each other. And we don't want any type of formal or informal policy to prevent that from happening. Now, we talked about the drivers and determinants of health. And um, they range in so many different ways of how that looks. So environmental, education, um, housing, transportation, you know, violence and safety, poverty, um, you know, you name it, food, nutrition, health and health care. What if I told you that one of the biggest drivers and determinants of health that we don't talk about is trust? Now, how we have to really have a conversation about building trust and sustaining trust in their communities um, to make sure that people understand and organizations understand that trust is so huge in the component. And then, you know, these are just some examples of how we've kind of helped to earn, build, and sustain trust in communities, but it's, you know, not the end all be all. So I don't want you to necessarily focus on just these, but Think about how are you building trust in your relationships in the community? And how are you building trust in your relationships you know, internally um, with your you know, external and internal stakeholders? And, and just think about you know, what has worked and what needs um, you know, maybe some, have some opportunities for us to grow. What are the issues that we really um, talk about is this issue of racism. Let me, let me level set here. When we talk about racism in this context, we're talking about systems of unshared power. And how those systems of unshared power are predicated and perpetuated um, by, you know, this long-standing monotony of creating systems of advantage and disadvantage for others. And as long as we are in that space, we reflect a lot on the work of Dr. Kamara Jones, who um, has these allegories on race and racism, or these stories, almost like parables of sorts, that um, teach us so much in just this illustration um, about race and racism, and um, it goes into some deeper detail. So when you get the slides, you can click on where it says Gardner's Tale and you take it to her TED Talk. Um, and she you know, speaks about 20 minutes on different allegories of race and racism. So superb. It really gets to the heart of what we see 
and how it can be um, internalized, um, whether personally um, or you know in a group or if you know through institutions, and how those systems of unshared unshared power are uh, important to dismantle and unearth. We also understand trauma is a key factor in what we see, and um, we've seen the killing of black and brown um, bodies uh, all across you know this nation and across the world and um, how that has a kind of um, impact on us <clears throat> and it can be triggering if we are exposed to it and um, we'll often talk about the historic traumas and triggers that we face um, especially connected to things like the Tuskegee experiment or the stolen sales from Henrietta Lacks, or the radon um, studies at the University of Cincinnati, or even um, eugenics where um, women of color were sterilized. Um, women from historically marginalized populations were sterilized against their will in a lot of cases. Um, and, so, and those are important conversations to have. But we also have to deal with on the daily ongoing traumatic stressors, uh, as my colleague Dr. Michelle Laws talks about, but the things that people deal with every day and how important that is. And one of those things is also going back to the conversation of bias. Now, bias um, plays a part in our decision making, the way we engage people. And there's a study here. If you go down to the bottom of the screen, you'll see a hyperlink for an article that talks about bias in the form of getting rid of bias in a school system in Miami Dade County led to um, children who were labeled, go back to labeling again, as um, you know, in remedial and placed in remedial classes, particularly the bias in the testing element that everybody tests for the gift and intelligence program, that you saw a lot of different people that were labeled incorrectly actually scoring high in these gifted and talented um, programs. And how important that is to, um, to see just taking out a bias can yield even greater results for people and give people better opportunities. So I'm gonna go through this section a little faster because I know time is running short for me, um, but I do wanna kind of just talk about incorporating the strategies and asking the right questions. So understanding that racial equity and health equity are different, but they're very connected and relatable. Um, and then also in that same breath and conversation, how important it is to consider culture and language in these spaces. And they make sure that we're using these tools appropriately when we're trying to get to equity and using that, um, that, that lens of fairness in the decisions that we make in the policies. So I want to ask us a few questions. You don't have to answer them right here, but these are things to think about. So when we're thinking about the cultural aspects of being inclusive, we want to ask ourselves, like, you know, who do we serve? And, and who makes up our community? Like, that's an important piece to see um, the importance of who we're connected to. And, um, and then also understanding what do our organizations look like? And that's important because if we're serving communities, it's good to know what the community looks like and then make that comparison to see is our workforce indicative of what the community uh, needs are? Like, are, do we have the ability to address community needs by being connected on like our hiring practices um, of our organization? And so have we done an environmental scan to even know what our organization uh, looks like and who makes up that organization? And I think, you know, it's also important to understand who's at the table um, when we're making decisions, uh, when we're, we're in communities, and then who needs to be there that's not there. And I think that's an uh, important aspect of the work that we do, of asking the right questions. Um, and then we, it moves us, um, not just into a DEI space, but we have to move past that DEI space to add a J. And that J is justice. And the justice uh, part of the Jedi principles that you know 
we can definitely come back and do a, a, a bigger, broader conversation on this. But it's making sure that we're dismantling those systems that, that we talked about earlier, those unshared power, and making sure that, that organizations know it's okay to create spaces um, in your organizations to, to seek actions that promote justice, to seek conversations that promote justice in this world. And I want to give you an example of how we move from DEI to JEDI, right? So in the DEI space, we talk about, you know, celebrating Black History Month um, and other heritage months. Where in the JEDI space, where you have the justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, you know, it's more about the acknowledgement of the contributions of, you know, Black and Brown individuals um, in this space, and then how we can honor uh, them every day and not just, you know, have it kind of pinned down to just one month. And so um, you may hear people say that Black History Month is 365, 366 on Luke year. And that's more of a, uh, a broader, more inclusive conversation of where we need to get to in our work. And so I just wanted to give you a few examples of how that can look. We created a toolkit um, to help with uh, engaging with, minor, um, with historically marginalized populations. And then we also um, have publications that kind of speak more to about how to incorporate equity in the space and be more inclusive. Um, and then um, the message, the way we um, have these conversations, like what are we doing uh, in this space to reach broader populations? And this is just a version of taking messages and doing it in a format that can be more inclusive and, and more reachable for people that are interested in what we have to say. I want to leave you with this quote attributed to our office, and it says, health equity is not the sole responsibility of one individual or one agency, but the collective responsibility of us all to do better, to be better, and to help others. And I say the same thing with being inclusive. I say the same thing about uh, pursuing justice, um, equity, and also ensuring that diversity is a part of your path, your pathways. So I will stop there and thank you so much for this opportunity and ability to speak to you. It has been my pleasure and I apologize if I talk too fast. Um, and did not get everything that you wanted me to touch on, but I hope we did. Thank you, Mr. Bright. Yes, jazz hands. <laughs> um, so we did leave a little bit of time here for question and answer. So if you do have a question for Mr. Wright, please go ahead and put that in the chat and we will address it. I did um, see some come in throughout the presentation, so I'll ask those now. Um, considering the political climate in the Carolinas, how do you suggest promoting equity in light of this subject being controversial to some North Carolina and South Carolina citizens? So, I think you have to ask yourself a lot of questions, right? Is it equity that is controversial or is it the unearthing of how people feel based on legacies that give pause to addressing things properly? And I don't have all the answers for that, right? Because, you know, just like where you live, where I live, things may change from you know, city line to city limit, right? And uh, different school systems, different um, county commissioners may have different approaches on what they see, how they feel, or what they connect maybe incorrectly. You know, there's a whole controversy about critical race theory that um, is, that's been going on. <clears throat> that's not always, um, the, the same conversations that get lumped into these equity conversations, but they could have a place in the conversation. And so you really have to start by helping to educate people on why it's important, and then also use um, data 
to help make those cases. Um, we, we know people have been suffering. We know people don't always have access to uh, good, clean, quality foods or water or um, you know, energy or things of that nature. And so what can we do to help people live? Because the things that sustain us are us and having more of us around can be helpful. Um, and so you need us to help vote. <laughs> you need us to help pay taxes. And so if we make um, those provisions for people to have um, you know, life and it, have it be sustainable and, and humanely sustainable, um, that, that makes a bigger difference in what we can do. And so if we approach equity at the next step in that process, it's, a, it's an easier conversation than just um, some of the ways that we've been having to go full force and uh, almost defend our right to be human. Another, this is a statement and a question. Um, so it says the number of employees in a certain organization or company will depend on whether it is geared to Hispanic community slash market. There will be more Hispanic than other ethnicities if business is geared towards Hispanic. In general terms though, it would mean we should see at least one Hispanic for every 10 employees, right? Or I guess that's the question. Like how, how, do, how should we think about that in terms of having our organization match or not necessarily match, but in line with our demographic? Yeah, you gotta, so you gotta look at a bunch of factors. You gotta look at how you made up, the size, who, what your focus is, um, there's so many factors to consider in, in this conversation, right? If you're a statewide organization, are you catering to just one side of the state, or are you connecting to all, you know, all the all the dots and creating more bridge points uh, all across the state? I know with some of the work that we've done, um, we don't have. Well, I know when we started COVID, we didn't necessarily have one statewide um, Hispanic Latino Latinx organization. And so we were able to fund five different organizations that connected mostly across the state to kind of meet the needs uh, that we were seeing in that community. Um, and I, I think there is some, some positive take home lessons that we've learned there um, in how to make sure we are connecting because there's different needs um, on different parts of, of the state, right? So if I'm in the low country here in South Carolina, I know there's gonna be different needs than when I'm you know, further west or, or more centralized. And so um, I do wanna say, it has nothing to do with the, the question that was asked, but I do wanna say that I did honeymoon in Kiowa Island in South Carolina when I uh, got married 15 years ago. So I, I really do appreciate uh, the different complexities of the area um, that exists in, in, especially in South Carolina, but also in other states, because it really helps you really uh, understand that what I need from where I live may be different than what other people need where they live. And so um, just seeing the different complexities as a tourist or as a family member, um, I was able to, to soak that in. So when we start thinking about um, what the needs are, what the aims are of your organization, um, what your reach is, those are things you have to factor in as well. So I don't know if we necessarily are saying, um, you know, every one out of 10 um, persons in an organization, because it also depends on the size of your organization, um, but there's, there's gotta be representation now. Um, and then when you have representation, you just can't throw everything on one person and say, oh, well, this is, you know, so-and-so, and they speak for this whole entire community, because then that, that doesn't work either. And last question, um, and then I'll hand it over to Deborah. And this one um, was a statement in the comment section, but I thought it may be a good question. Um, someone states, 
understanding it's going to be more difficult to gain trust in the Hispanic community due to fear of outcome if they share too much of their personal and family info, what things should we think about when we are communicating with the Hispanic community based on that? No, this is a great question because um, there's always this underlying fear of things being used against people. And when we started the COVID work, um, especially in North Carolina, that was something that came up when um, you're a little hard to hear. I'm sorry. Sorry. Can you hear me now? I think I was adjusting my my nose. <laughs> um, one thing that was that came up that was important for us to understand was when we started COVID work and doing testing. One of the things that we had to quickly adjust and pivot was the police presence. Um, at events, because, you know, if you think about two years ago, we had a different federal administration, uh, and there were different things going on that did not um, really promote conversations or um, allow for uh, good relations from uh, government entities in um, certain communities. And so, even though in like public health spaces, we want to make sure that people are accessing the services that can help them. It, at, it doesn't help if it's at the expense of their freedom. And um, I think those were some of the things we had to learn how to adjust and um, kind of work with law enforcement on our end to, to be um, either not in the space or not as visible um, so that people could still feel protected and accessing and assessing those services that they needed. So it is, it is something that, you know, we often have to think about on our approaches for many of us who think it's just a standard, you know, uh, activity. We also have to understand the needs of others in that space that may not feel as comfortable or as free. Thank you so much, Mr. Wright, for um, participating in today's workshop. Um, we are going to move into our um, panelist conversation with uh, and I'll, I'll give it over to Deborah um, in just a minute to introduce our panelists. I will say I did just see these two questions come in um, in the Q&A. We will address those after the panelist conversation. So I apologize for that. Thank you so much, Sabrina. Um, and thank you everyone that is joining us today. As uh, Sabrina mentioned, you can still use the Q&A feature and we will make sure to answer those questions um, after our panelists is done. Before we go into questions, I would like to take some time um, to introduce our panelists today. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Edward Anderson and Ruth Rivera. Dr. Edward Anderson is the Executive Director of On Track Greenville at United Way of Greenville County. On Track Greenville is a community initiative designed to keep students on track to high school graduation and post-secondary success. He spent his entire career working alongside communities and schools that are in poverty. He understands that poverty is a great barrier to student success but believes that children of poverty, when met with strategies and intervention, can be as successful and productive as their non-impoverished peers. Trying to speak slow um, for our interpreter. Dr. Anderson attended the University of South Carolina, where he earned a bachelor's degree in education and later a master's in curriculum and instruction and a doctoral degree in education, leadership, and technology. He has 12 years of experience as a teacher, district level academy specialist, assistant principal, and principal. 
his wife, Cassie, who is a teacher, and his two sons, Edison, who is seven, and Micah, who is three, keep him centered. He currently serves on the Board of Directors for Children's Trust of South Carolina, an organization aimed at preventing child abuse, neglect, and injury. Additionally, Dr. Anderson serves as mentor for the African American Male Scholar Initiative at Greenville Tech. He is a member of African American Leadership Greenville, along with Young Leader Society, and is a co-founder of Bold Leadership, which is focused on uplifting the profession of education, more specifically on supporting African American male educators. We also have today with us Ruth Rivera. Ruth is the manager of the PASOS program with Prisma Health. Um, Ruth provides oversight and management of program development, community relations, marketing, and strategy planning for specific to PASOS. Ruth came to the United States from Venezuela in 2000 with her family. After experiencing firsthand the struggles immigrants face, her love of advocating for the Hispanic community became stronger. She quickly learned English and started helping church members and her community by interpreting in different government agencies and hospitals. After finishing college in 2008, Ruth joined Prisma Health and served as a Spanish medical interpreter under the language services department. During this time, Ruth learned the barriers many patients were experiencing and collaborated with the department leaders to enhance quality of service provided to the Hispanic population of Greenville. Ruth's passion and focus on serving the community extends beyond her daily responsibility. She serves as a member of several Prisma Health Upstate Committees. She is also an active member of the Board of Directors for Liverpool Greenville and the Piedmont Health Foundation. She is also the chair of the Hispanic Alliance Health Team and the co-founder for the Latino Community Outreach Advisory Council in Oconee County. Lastly, Ruth served as member of the Hispanic Latinx Affairs Advisory Committee, where she advocates for the Hispanic community of South Carolina. Ruth has dedicated her adult life serving those in need in her community, always seeking to help families in the places where she has lived. It is her goal to continue advocating to make healthcare accessible to the most vulnerable and to work with those around her to create a better and more efficient way to serve the community at large. Thank you so much for joining us today. And again, it is an honor and pleasure to have you both here. I will start with a question for Dr. Edward Anderson. How has your organization included culturally inclusivity practices? Thank you, Deborah, um, and thank you for that introduction. So um, I'm excited to be here, uh, Mr. Wright. It was, your presentation was amazing. Um, it's already given me some things to consider as I move forward as a leader for our own track. So I'll start with my prior role. My prior role was as principal at Tanglewood Middle School. And for those of you that are from the area, um, at the time, my school was about 45% um, African-American, 45% um, Latino students. So equity, meeting my kids and my families and my students where they were, but also that justice piece was essential to doing my job. Um, one of the things that um, I was able to do as principal was directly influence policy in my building, um, which is different than where I am now, but at the time I was able to directly influence policy. Um, I was responsible for seven to 800 kids, families, over hundred teachers, right, and staff at the same time. And one way that I did that was through micro communities ensuring that we created communities of belonging for everyone in our school, given opportunities for different town hall meetings and so forth for everyone to be included um, in decision-making, um, but again, developing that sense of belonging. I have always felt and always known that if, as an educator, spe spe uh, specifically, that if you can gain the trust of the students, then you have a better chance of engaging their families and their parents as well. And so, through um, creating those micro communities, it might look like a club for one group of students. It may look like um, advocating them for the in, in, on behalf of the community or coming to an event um, for others. But we kept track of ways in which we were engaging with different 
um, different populations in our school. But because of those efforts, we earned the Diverse Leadership Award at Riley Institute um, for the development of, of those um, critical pieces. As an ED for On Track right now, my role is to work between the community and the schools to ensure that students have the best chance at successful outcomes as possible. Now, I don't get to directly put policies into place like I did as a principal, but I have a much larger platform, of course, and I get to inform policies at multiple schools and at the district level and in the community. So it's a little bit different. Um, in order to do that, I, got, I have to continue to be a cha champion for equity, giving my students, families, and the overall community what they need to, um, to serve their our target audience. Um, I think it's critical for anyone who's working in our community, especially in our schools, and again, health and, and any of the our community sectors, we have to be culturally sensitive. Um, everyone doesn't come from the same place, have the same experience, nor the same beliefs. Um, it doesn't make anyone less, less than as a result. And I think we have to figure out how we recognize and appreciate the strengths of everyone in order to move the community forward in a way that is just. Um, I can give you um, a specific example um, of some of that change. Um, basically, um, I worked closely with one school over the past couple of years that's had a rash of complaints from our Hispanic families in particular about the front office staff um, and some other support personnel that were not acting appropriately. Um, they were being rude, brushing families off, and when they had a concern or a challenge or even a basic question, um, you know, they were getting a lot of nonverbal um, dismisses, dis, um, dismissive behavior. Um, so once we found out about it, um, we engaged an equity coach and went to the principal of that school. Um, she worked alongside the school leaders to identify what those areas of need were, worked on a school-wide plan, shifted some of their mission and vision. Um, honestly, some people left because they didn't like the shift that was occurring. And unfortunately, some people had to be dismissed um, as a result of it. Um, but I, will, I am proud to say there's been little to no complaints at that specific school since that cultural sensitivity is, is, um, has improved. Um, and then new staff were hired under the understanding of that expectation with leaders knowing how to monitor those behaviors. For me, it was accountability. We held them accountable for their misbehavior because some of it was just misbehavior. Um, and then number two, we, we were able, we were in a position to provide direct supports to that school. So that allowed them to show that we weren't just about talking, but we were actually about engaging and helping them. And then thirdly, I was able to impact the policy in that building. By, by gaining that trust, they believe in our coach, they believe in the work. And so then it became entrenched in that school community and those families. So I would say, I know it was a long way to say yes, I would say accountability, direct supports, and then finally policy change came into play after that trust was built. Yeah, I know we're going to have a question about policy change. Ruth, um, all organizations can have access to training as part of the onboarding process. How can we encourage organizations and businesses to adopt this policy? Yes, thank you, Deborah. Thank you for that awesome um, introduction. I have to say that in order for that to happen, and this is very similar to Dr. Anderson's um, point of view as well, one of the things that I have to put in perspective first, the, give you a little bit of background context on what we do. Um, I work for Prisma Health, which is the largest health system in South Carolina. And Prisma Health has adopted PASOS, which is a community-based organization that serves our Hispanic and Latinx population. Um, and what PASOS specifically does is it connects our families to our health system. So see it as we're the bridge, we're that liaison between the patient and our health system, right? When we have a community that is new and a community that is learning and, and just coming in, um, it's really hard for someone to come in and, um, and just adjust to the health system, right? So that's part of what PASOS does, um, does that connection to our resources. All of our staff is bilingual, it's bicultural, and we do um, a lot of that connection um, with our family. So one of the biggest things that PASOS does is build that trust. It's just like we've mentioned it already. Um, one of the things that you can take with you um, after the presentation today is 
is that one-on-one -on -one connection and that direct trust with our families. And that's what FASOS does to engage and to have that connection. Um, we build that straight a connection relationship once because we are embedded with the health system. We have um, our staff directly connecting with nurses, with staff, and we're able to have that education. So one of the things that, and, and, and it goes back to what Dr. Anderson was talking was, we as humans, anyone, we fear what we don't know. And most of the times, if we fear the fact that I don't know the language, I don't understand their culture, I don't know how to handle that, so we dismiss, right? And that's kind of what Dr. Anderson was talking about. Our community-based organization and our, our team comes in as we, we come in, we hold the, the staff members' hand and say, we know how to work with our Hispanic population. Let me teach you about our culture. Let me tell you, and, and that curiosity starts coming up and starts asking questions. And, and it really opens that opportunity for conversation for that one-on-one -on -one education. And that has really helped and encouraged a lot of our staff with Prisma Health, not to only um, work with our community, but be more open to understand. So it all goes back to that trust and that connection with our family. Um, one of the things that um, I wanted to also mention was we have those open doors because of our connection with PASOS and our community-based organization and Prisma Health, we're able to have that open door for questions, for concerns, to be able to just have that relationship that it goes deeper than having a medical interpreter. And that's something else that really helps um, when you are looking into being more inclusive, more culturally inclusive is, yes, have a, depending on, on your organization, have your language services department, have your interpreters, have all that because you need that to communicate with patients and with your uh, participants. But if you're able to have a community-based organization that can deeply connect with families and gain that trust, it is going to be a game changer. Um, it's one of the things that really has proven here in the almost 10 years we've been with PASOS, with PRISMA, um, more than 10 years, actually. Um, and so, yes, I, that's part of the, the piece that really helps. And someone, um, I think it was Mr. Wright was talking about um, how do we do that health equity piece. How do we, and someone mentioned something about with our Hispanic population, it is even harder to gain their trust. And I'll give you a simple example. Um, when COVID started and we started doing community testings out in the community, right? I mean, COVID was scary as, as it could be for anyone. And it was even scarier for our community because again, our Hispanic families have different barriers. We realized that we had, uh, when we started doing COVID uh, testings out in the community, realized that because we were in the middle of a pandemic, the National Guard was to help us with um, moving traffic and just being there to help us. Um, many of our families are undocumented and do not, and do not trust a lot of um, government entities. So we placed the very first COVID testing over at the biggest grocery store for our Hispanic families here in the area. And we were ready to go the day before we go to set up the map and make sure everything's ready to go. We see the National Guard come. And I told my boss at the time, I said, can, can they just go? Like, we don't, we'll just have volunteers directing traffic. Um, of course, they couldn't go. They, they, they were not allowed to go. Um, so we started promoting the event saying, look, the National Guard is going to be here. Nothing is going to happen. Um, and our community leaders started promoting this as well. Next day, we had the event. We were very strategic on having female um, National Guards at the front so they could be less scary. Um, 
And it was such a good because of that trust that we already had with Pasos, that the community knew Pasos is there, I trust, I'm okay. And it helped, I'm telling you, it helped so much from that day until now, anything that is around COVID, we're able to connect and our families are engaging. And it's such a good uh, story to tell about just the health equity that we will be able to build just by that connection that we have with us. I hope that answers your question. Yes, I, I and I do remember that day at, at La Unica and the National Guard. Um, and, and it's just a learning experience. Now talking about um, you know learning experiences and Dr. Anderson, you touched a little bit about um, you know how you all assess the situation in this school and what steps did you take um, for Ruth and for Dr. Anderson. Are there any um, policies, systems, or environmental changes um, that you have implemented that perhaps we didn't touch um, during our conversation today? I'm happy to go. So one of the things that we have, we didn't implement it completely ourselves, of course, I will not ever take um, all the credit, but a lot of what we do is we do a lot of advocacy and we work hand in hand with our language services department, which are an amazing team of individuals. Um, and we do a lot of that connection to make sure that all of the documentation is being provided in Spanish to our families. Um, any discharge information will make sure that it's printed in, in the language needed. And that's been something that's been a game changer for a lot of our families as well. Uh, just being able to have that written communication in the person's language, which has been great. And on our end, um, again, I keep seeing that pop up in the chat, chat box and, and Ms. Rivera keeps touching on it as well with trust. Um, bringing resources to the table, not just asking an organization or entity to shift their practices. Um, but I think sometimes in order to develop that trust, you got to bring something to the table as well. You can't just tell them what to do. And some of the ways that we have really kind of influenced the system for Greenwood County, especially um, is through our work with our family support specialist, uh, Gina, who um, is on this call. Um, Gina is amazing in, in the work that she does. Um, she delivers one uh, utility service assistance and so forth. Um, she is bilingual um, and works deeply in um, all communities in Greenville County. Um, but um, an another way, um, is, well, one way that she interacts with, she brings family monthly meetings to our families, um, utilizing translation services, um, ensuring that everything is translated in, in different and in, in their language and whatever languages are needed to be translated into building those direct conversations with the families so that she can continue to evolve the work that she's doing along the way. It's not just static and this is the way we're doing it, but it's evolving based on the needs of the community. So being very responsive. Um, and also um, we've we really engaged in a technology um, that provides language and literacy equity. And so when community resources go out, um, oftentimes it's, it's in English, right? Um, but we have created or worked with a company um, called School Connect, actually, where we receive community announcements or resources um, that will um, be sent to an app on our family's phones, and it translates it into over 100 languages. They're able to provide, like, it speaks out as well. So if they have issues with like literacy, then it can read it, the, the information out to them in their language. And if they have questions about the resource or the event or whatnot, they can um, message back in their language and we get it back in, in our language. And so um, that's been a great two-way communicative, but also announcement system that we've implemented in our SIT schools and piloted, but we're hoping to do a community-wide release. A lot of times what happens within the, the on-track school specifically, um, we develop the, the framework, we develop and then after we do that, um, the district then adopts those recommendations by on track into the rest of the system. So I like to think of us kind of this little, little petri dish of equity that if we can prove it while we, we have it, while we have the trust there and built, then we can have an impact on the rest of the county. Thank you. We have a question here um, in our question box. Any immediate ideas for implementing a culture of inclusivity in the workplace among staff? Uh, 
yes. Um, I'd say, I don't know your staff, but I'd say hire more um, individual, have diversity in your team, first of all. Um, diversity will bring you those very organic conversations um, that can be very healthy for the organization. And that's one of the things that I, I, can, I can tell you that has worked really well with our department. Um, it's having more individuals, more bilingual, bicultural staff. It doesn't have to be Hispanic, of course. Um, just having that conversation um, organically can really help you to get started, I'd say. I agree. Um, one of the things that we're currently working on is creating safe spaces. Um, so you have to create a psychologically safe space for the people on your team to feel as though they can even share. Um, that's by creating what, what Ruth said in terms of just one, expectations that we are looking to diversify um, in order to meet the needs of, um, of everyone, ourselves included, um, and to better understand and become more culturally, culturally sensitive and so forth. Um, but also um, creating that psychological safety for retention of our staff, creating that psychological safety to get the best out of everyone, as opposed to someone sitting in a meeting and they really want to say something and they have an amazing idea about what we could be doing, but they don't know if their idea is going to be received well by those in the room. So if we don't start by creating those safe spaces for everyone to give their best and their all and understand that what they bring to the table is welcome, then we really won't get anywhere. We're going to continue to have insular thinking about policy and, and, um, and shifts. So Again, I'm, I'm really heavy on what are we doing internally to create spaces. I also say um, what you were talking about earlier, Dr. Anderson, is keeping uh, staff accountable. Uh, keeping that accountability um, is key to, to make sure that staff know that they can trust you as the leader and as the organization, and that if someone is not doing things correctly, that they would be uh, followed up with. Thank you. We have tons of comments in the chat box, and I know that questions um, keep pouring in as well. Sabrina, anything on your side from questions that we want to prioritize before we close? Just to give us enough time to close, what we'll do is we'll go through and make sure that we gather all of these questions and send out responses after the workshop. So we apologize if we didn't get to any of the questions, um, we will uh, address that. Quick thing though, um, uh, Dr. Anderson, what was the communication app you mentioned? The app is called School Connect and Connect is spelled C-N-X-T. Awesome. And, and if you want to send us information to go to that app to be delivered into our communities, then we can take that and, and push it out at any point. That's great. So I'll hand it over to Vanessa with that. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you, Dr. Anderson, Ruth, and Debra for this great panel. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Uh, now that we know better, we can do better. So please share on the chat box what is one strategy, action, or change you plan on implementing since being part of this training. We want to see on the chat. And also, one thing your organization can commit to do to be more culturally inclusive. Okay. Thank you, Debra. Uh, we will share by email and in the chat a best practice document from our first workshop, uh, Language Justice, and also a local interpretation and translation resources, because we want uh, to invite you to take action. Um, also, Erika will share and add the survey link, uh, and we ask you to complete so we can include your thoughts and recommendations 
on our action plan that we are moving forward working with this. Uh, closing, I just want to say thank you from our build facilitation team to our presenters, to our build partners, to our build TA team, our funder, and you for accepting this challenge. I will include uh, in the chat my contact information to continue this journey and work together. Thank you for being here with us.